There will be an opportunity for silent prayer and meditation. Please be seated. <coughs> members of the executive, members of parliament, our diplomatic corps, members of the diplomatic corps, and guests, you are most welcome. I will now ask the secretary to read the order. Debate on vote number five, International Relations and Cooperation Appropriation Bill. I will now call the Honorable the Minister of International Relations and Cooperation, <laughs> Honorable Maite Mashaba. Honorable uh, uh, Chairperson, I can see uh, our brand new uh, uh, Honorable Deputy Ministers walking into the room. Honorable uh, members, our former Honorable uh, Deputy Ministers, in particular our veteran Ibrahim, Honorable Ibrahim Ibrahim, uh, Your Excellencies, Ambassadors uh, and High Commissioners, representatives of the international organizations, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Let us on the outset pay once more our condolences to the demise that happened to MH17, to the government and the people of Malaysia, Netherlands, and all nations that have lost their loved ones through this tragedy, including our own South Africans. Honorable Chair. Here we are, as South Africans, our membership of BRICS is stronger than ever before. We were there at the summit, the third summit of BRICS in Sanya, China, when the vision document of what BRICS is about was crafted and adopted. We were in New Delhi, in India, when the idea of a development bank by largely the countries of the South was mooted. We hosted in Etiquini Deben the historic decision to establish the bank, the new development bank of the BRICS. From Etiquini Deben, to the recent sixth BRICS summit in Brazil. This has brought a new groundbreaking institution called New Development Bank. In Brazil, our leaders reaffirmed once more our core vision to bring about a democratic, multipolar world closer. This is the world our forebearers fought for, sacrificed life and limb for. This is the world we want. This is the world we continue to yearn for. South Africa, as the previous chair, successfully brought to fruition all key outcomes adopted at the last round of the BRICS uh, summits, the fifth one, in Deben. As such, in Brazil, the agreement to establish the bank and the treaty for the creation for BRICS contingent reserve, reserves arrangements were signed. They are now legal documents. This agreement signal a historic and seminal moment since the creation of Bretton Woods International Financial Architecture. South Africa feel it, it's here, you're part of this history. The headquarters of the New Development Bank will be located in Shanghai, China, and its Africa Regional Center will be established 
in South Africa concurrently to safeguard the interests of our continent. Further significant initiatives in respect of strengthening intra BRICS economic cooperation included the signing of a memorandum of understanding on cooperation among BRICS export uh, credit insurance and guarantees agencies that will improve support and support the environment for increasing trade opportunities among BRICS member states. In BRICS, the member states are equal in access to institutions we create. This will include the shareholding of the bank. We are all equal. There's no big and small. And the representation in leadership is done through consensus, not through some consultants. This is groundbreaking. This is change in action. <laughs> Madam Chair and Honorable Members, indeed in the State of the Nation Address, President Zuma was unequivocal about what needs to be done to move South Africa forward in the next five years. In his own words, he said, and I quote, as we enter the second phase of transition from apartheid to a national democratic society, we have to embark on radical socioeconomic transformation to push back the triple challenges of inequality, poverty, and unemployment. Change will not come about with some, without some far-reaching interventions, I close quote. What needs to be done in the next coming five years must find resonance with this undertaking. South Africa's foreign policy is driven by the vision to achieve an African continent that is prosperous, peaceful, democratic, united, and assertive in defense of its interest in world affairs. Today, as we enter the third decade of our freedom, it is therefore appropriate that we focus on the foreign policy task and challenges that lie ahead of us in the next coming five years. Our foreign policy has had crucial role to play in the interventions required to realize the intended goals of the second transition. The task ahead may be daunting, but our experience of the last two decades has schooled us in how to master the balance between our domestic and international priorities and between the values we cherish and the pursuit of our national interests abroad. We move forward into the next coming five years conscious that we have a solid national development plan that seeks to guide our actions as set uh, priorities for our international relations mandate. Honorable Chair, the continent is currently engaged in ex uh, extensive consultations on its vision for the next 50 years, known as Agenda 2063. Before we celebrated the 50th anniversary, we were talking about Vision 2063. Now we are in the first year of the fifth, next 50 years. And I jokingly say to my kids, I'll still be around in the next coming 50 years. I'll just be this around 100. So I want to see this agenda in action and implemented. The theme of the agenda 2063 is the Africa we want. This vision that has become an action plan, which is expected to be adopted uh, in January's 2015 summit of the African Union, spells out the aspirations of African people across all sectors and the pledges of our leaders, which are translated into a call to action comprised of 10-year action plans that will contain flagship projects. Each AU member state, including South Africa, is expected co to contribute to the vision through the inclusive national consultations by October this year. When the vision is adopted, member states will have to align their national uh, policies with it through a process of domestication, which in our case will entail harmonizing Agenda 2063 with our National Development Plan. DICO has already begun our national consultation with different uh, sectors. We will be approaching the uh, parliament in due course with a proposal to consider holding a special debate on Agenda 2063. 
This vision has the potential to become a game changer on the continent and South Africa can help ensure that this happens. Agenda 2063 will impact on SADC, especially the pace and the direction of the in, uh, integration of our region. Our approach to the SADC region in the five years will aim at consolidating bilateral relations uh, with our neighbors and strengthening SADC as an institution. In particular, we'll focus on the following. Strengthen regional integration in our SADC neighborhood by discharging our responsibilities towards the full implementation of our free trade area, including the current review of SADC regional indicative uh, strategic uh, development plan. The SADC EAC Commerce tripartite trade negotiations must reach finality as they are an important step forward towards the realization of the African free trade by 2017. Peace and political stability in our region will remain a priority. We are encouraged by, by the proactive and stabilizing effect that resulted from the deployment of the SADC uh, Intervention Brigade in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where the negative forces there are either on the retreat or have been defeated. On behalf of the people and the government of South Africa, let me take this opportunity to pay special homage and tribute to our men and women in uniform who are involved in peace missions. <laughs> Their selfless sacrifice continue to inspire us. We are now commanding real respect. When you go around in these parts of the region, they say, Obaboni na. Did you see what they did? In less than a week, there was peace and quiet in some areas where peace was unknown for decades. In this regard, we will also operationalize the tripartite uh, agreement between South Africa, Angola, and the DRC in support of peace and security framework agreement for the Great Lakes regions. We will galvanize political support for major infrastructure projects in our region, notably the Lesotho Highlands, the second phase of the Lesotho Highlands Water Project. And I know that parliamentarians would be very busy very soon uh, through the Department of Energy for the ratification of the Grand Inga Treaty in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Then immediately the implementation must ensue. For the rest of Africa, in the context of Agenda 2063, in the next coming five years, DICO will continue to strengthen bilateral relations with African countries through structured bilateral engagements to ad uh, advance South Africa's interests throughout the continent, intensify our work in supporting the African Union, including its institutions, namely the ones we host, NEPAD, Pan-African Parliament, and APRM. Strengthen economic diplomacy to increase trade and investment opportunities for South Africa, give dedicated attention to North-South Corridor and other NEPA-driven infrastructure projects on our continent championed by our president. Ensure speedy provision of humanitarian assistance where needed to alleviate human suffering on the continent. Implement the African Diaspora Program adopted here in South Africa when we hosted the summit with the AU in 2012. Uh, continue uh, peace building and conflict prevention efforts in conflict situation in support of multilateral institutions and also reinvigorate our post-conflict and reconstruction and development strategy in African countries emerging from conflict. Honorable Chair, I don't know how many of us still recall that we are practically, basically, historically supposed to still be a post-conflict country but we have done so well ourselves that we've even forgotten that 20 years ago, we were a conflict-ridden country. <laughs> Honorable Chair, it is indeed with, uh, within our ongoing strategy to continue supporting Africa's peace efforts through mediation, troops contribu at contribution for peacekeeping, and by providing material and financial assistance the sterling work of the Deputy President Cyril Ramaphosa in South Sudan is one, just but one example. South Africans don't send troops first. 
Our history has taught us that. We use our diplomacy. We use our elders. We use our leaders. We communicate with our, the regional blocs and the AU. And when people who contest for elections and lose, and then start negotiating power because they are mutineers, want to take over government or negotiate power with democratically elected governments, that's when we intervene. And that's when we should intervene to sustain the democracy project on our continent. The African Union Peace and Security Council has just celebrated its 10th anniversary, and we look back with pride at what it has achieved. South Africa has recently assumed its two-year membership of this region, which will be used to focus on the restoration of constitutional order in Central African Republic, stability of the DRC, Libya, Somalia, and South Sudan. The operationalization of the African peace and security architecture remains a critical element in providing the African Union with the necessary capacity to respond to our challenges of peace and security. The establishment of African capacity for immediate response for crisis, ASIRIC, championed by South Africa, is an interim mechanism to enable the African Union to respond to emerging security situations while the African standby force is being operationalized. The increasing scourge of terrorism on our continent, especially in parts of East, West, and North Africa, is a menace that must be fought and defeated. I'm sure many mothers still cannot go to sleep tight knowing that there are more than 200 girls out there still in the jungle in Nigeria, and we don't know what their fate is. Chairperson, honorable members, South-South cooperation is important in South Africa's foreign policy architecture, historically. Our approach to South-South cooperation in the next coming five years must be anchored on South-South forests like the BRICS, IPSA, and FOCAC, which we will be honored to host in 2015. That is a forum for cooperation between Africa and China. And also we will uh, uh, intensify our engagement in multilateral bodies that also have the South, or are championed by the countries of the South, like the NAM, G77 plus China, amongst others, as well as a network of bilateral relations we have established with the countries uh, of Asia and Middle East, Latin America and Caribbean. The key elements of this cooperation are the promotion of political and diplomatic relations enhancing trade investment and other economic collab uh, relations, collaboration on global uh, issues for a better world. I was quite humbled when we had the last BRICS summit, when the president of Colombia sent his foreign minister to say, that which you are, you have sent your president, your deputy president to do in South Sudan and, and Sri Lanka. We Colombians also would want your model. So this is what we are known for, to work for peace. <laughs> Latin America and Caribbean have very historic significance to our relations. South Africa shares a long history of cordial relations with the Americas and the larger, and, and also, as I said, the Caribbean. South Africa will continue to utilize the strong political relations in historic with the countries of Asia and Middle East the long-standing relationship and solidarity to further relations and leverage on all other important elements of a, of, an, of a relation. Honorable members, Chair, the restoration of lasting peace in the Middle East is in our interest. Here, His Excellency President Zuma will be dispatching a team led by our former Deputy Honorable Minister. Honorable Minister, you have two minutes left. Oh to Israel and Palestine to convey our concern over the escalation of violence in that part of the world. The senseless killing of women and children must stop now. We must silence the gun. We will also be contributing $1 million uh, for human assistance to Palestinian women and children through UN agencies in the nearest future. 
we are keen to also cooperate and contribute to Operation Pakisa through our participation in the Indian Ocean Rim. We are looking forward to the US-Africa Summit. We will continue expanding our relations with our friends in Europe, and we welcome the signing of the EPAS agreement that has been negotiated for the past uh, 10 years. We will continue to work and yearn for the reforms of the UN, in particular UN Security Council, as we celebrate the, UN, the 70th anniversary of the UN. We'll continue to defend the UNF, UNFCCC successes as we did in Durban, the Million Development Goals, the Rio Plus 20, and the Durban Legacy on World Conference Against Racism. We'll continue to champion development in the G20. We also would want to congratulate Navi Pillay for her completion of a six-year tenure in the United Nations High Commission as a High Commissioner for Human Rights. And as I've already been called uh, to order, I just want to reiterate that we will continue to champion diplomacy of Ubuntu. We'll strengthen our DTRD the training. We are launching the diplomacy of Johnny Makatini and we'll have 50 young cadres going out to the world to strengthen this. Thank we will transform our Honourable ARF Minister. into a in, uh, SATPA, <coughs> as you had called upon for us to do that. Honorable Minister, you Thank you so much, uh, Honorable Chairperson. In the Lenzela, but we are on track. I thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister. We now call on the Chairperson of International Relations and Cooperation, Honorable Masango. Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Minister Nkwana Mashabane, Honorable Deputy Ministers Mfegeto and Lenders, Honorable Members of the Portfolio Committee on International Relations, members of the Diplomatic Corps, here present distinguished guests, fellow compatriots. We began this year on a very sad note. The merciless jaws of death had snuffed out the precious life of one of humanity's great icons, the former President of the Republic and President of the ANC, Mr. Nelson Mandela. Over the years, the state protocol services has been tirelessly and diligently providing effective protocol services to facilitate incoming and outgoing high-level visits and ceremonial events. The international community has experienced the warm South African welcome and Ubuntu every time they've been hosted. The department should be singularly applauded for the part they played during the funeral of our beloved former President Mandela in December 2013 when many heads of state and government descended into our country to bid farewell to the father of the nation. However, this year allows us to reflect on the last 20 years of our democracy and set the tone for the future as we begin the very important work of the fifth democratic parliament. As we begin this work, we continue to be guided by the Freedom Charter's injunction, quote unquote, there shall be peace and security. South Africa's foreign policy is informed by very clear principles of democracy, equality, and human rights. In other words, what we wish for ourselves, we also wish for the rest of humanity. No sooner had we become a constitutional democratic state in 1994 than we also uns quickly unshackled our pariah status and re-entered the international family of nations. Honorable members, it is important to note that 20 years ago, South Africa had only 34 missions abroad. 20 years later, we have 125 missions abroad and are now accredited to 160 countries and organizations. By the way, Minister, you have contributed immensely to this effort, ably assisted by patriotic South Africans deployed in the Foreign Service. President Zuma was correct to utilize your attributes in this portfolio. <laughs> South Africa is today one of the significant players in the global community. And it is our responsibility as a parliament to ensure that our country is successful in its endeavors. Thank you, Honorable Minister. 
by Khurume Jelemova. Africa features prominently in our country's foreign policy, and that is in large part because we have recognized that our past, present, and future has always been inextricably woven to that of the African continent. Africa contributed immeasurably towards our own liberation struggle. In the State of the Nation Address, President Zuma noted that African agenda remains at the center of our foreign policy. As such, South Africa has worked tirelessly to strengthen its support for the African Union, the SADC, and all continental bodies whose purpose is to achieve peace and security. Whilst talking about Africa, let me congratulate Honorable Balega Mbete, our Speaker of National Assembly, and Honorable Dr. Z. Paolo Jordan, on their deployment to lead our parliamentarians in the SADC PF and Pan African Parliament, respectively. Both of them are distinguished leaders of our glorious movement, the ANC. To this end, we are pleased that the African Union Summit Assembly of Heads of State and Government that was held in June 2014 has approved the revised Pan African Parliament's protocol unanimously. This watershed decision has assigned the African Union's lawmaking process to the Pan African Parliament, subject to the approval by the AU Assembly of Heads of State and Government. Honorable members, in his, state, in his previous State of the Nation address, President Zuma also emphasized that South Africa has prioritized the promotion of regional economic integration, infrastructure development, intra-African trade, interconnectivity, and sustainable development in the continent. But I would also like to remind all of you that South-South cooperation has and will also continue to feature as one of our country's key strategic priorities. Against this backdrop, I wish to reflect on one of our country's key strategic frameworks. But before I do so, I must emphasize that foreign policy development in the 21st century is a multidimensional endeavor with states using different avenues to pursue their various interests. South Africa has chosen BRICS as a potential avenue that can contribute greatly to the country's regional development. Our membership of BRICS should be understood in the context of our wish to alleviate the challenges facing the African continent, most of which are a legacy of the colonization of Africa. The complex nature of these challenges has compelled the South African government to single out infrastructure as a key vehicle for improved quality of life, which is also expected to create jobs and heighten our competitiveness. To this end, the Presidential Infrastructure Championing Initiative comes in handy to boost the North-South Corridor. I would like to congratulate the BRICS member states for their visionary leadership because this new development plan will be an alternative from the obstructive conditionalities that were imposed by the IMF and the World Bank. Honorable members, we must not forget the importance of peace and stability, given the challenges we have witnessed in countries such as the Democratic Republic of Congo, Guinea-Bissau, Central African Republic, and Somalia. It is imperative that we remain committed to strengthening the peace and security initiative of the African continent. Members will recall that in the State of the Nation Address, President Zuma noted that South Africa will contribute, will continue, I'm sorry, supporting Africa's peace efforts, including through mediation, troop contribution for peace keeping and by providing material and financial assistance. I am of the view that peace and stability is one of the cornerstones of a people-centered democracy and development in the African continent. And this is the nerve center of our national interest. We can achieve this only through the establishment of relevant institutions and the strengthening of the African standby force within the Peace and Security Council of the AU. This standby force gives full meaning to the principle of African solutions to African problems. As a parliament, it will be of vital importance that we work tirelessly with the department and the progressive formations of civil society to ensure that solidarity, development, peace, and stability continue to be priority areas of, 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 of engagement. The department must ensure that economic diplomacy finds its fullest possible expression in the work it does whilst executing the country's foreign policy. So, Minister, training on economic diplomacy becomes an extremely important skill 
South African negotiators will then be in a position to put our economic interest and that of Africa in the forefront before concluding trade agreements. The National Development Plan Vision 2030 provides good guidelines for development within South Africa and how we will contribute in the development of the African continent. Our trading relations with the European Union is of strategic importance. However, the, EU, the EU's protectionist policy on their agricultural and citrus products makes their markets inaccessible to us. It accounts for, amongst others, for the current trade deficit in favor of the EU. We fully support our government in demanding that the UN Security Council be made representative, participative, and democratic. On the 8th November 2012, South Africa was elected to the Economic and Social Council for the United Nations. The membership of ECOSOC will provide South Africa with an opportunity to contribute to the strengthening and reform of the UN organ. It will provide us with an opportunity to be located at the center of the de debate on the global development agenda, including the acceleration of the implementation of the MDG. South Africa must utilize its participation in the G20, the G77, the World Economic Forum, and the WTO to push the African agenda and articulate perspectives of progressive humanity in these bodies. Because there is a shift towards the use of the Indian Ocean as a frontier of global economic growth, marine secu uh, security and transport, South Africa Minister should use its participation in the Indian Ocean Rim Association to grow the SA and SADC economies respectively. Mpati mdambo otlon pegilego, ngongo che ngi chejebo nyana, ichebe swana na mbere kiswana na mazwe wangwa pande, lea kule lea njonjo bala, kwa tu wana ngongo che no khul mende wetu. Abarake le pambi le bakulu mele, baluele bekotu, basagele iji ma lo kchapulu la kwa bandwe Palestina. Sbabo nyana ngongo che azwagali se ilizwe la bandwe seula Afrika, kutanga no yezi izwe, bonyana skambisani no kutatelwa ina, no kutakiswa, ukutoriswa, ukulawa, ukumanywa, ukutusulwa, no kutindeze la wama lunge la bandwe be Palestina, buye pubundu. For years now, the ANC has been calling for the granting of self-determination to the people of Western Sahara. South Africa is committed to seeing their right to self-determination realized. It is vitally important that the mandate of the MINORSO be amended to include human rights monitoring and the exploitation of rural resources in the occupied territories. Morocco should lift the military, security, and media blockout imposed in the occupied territories of Western Sahara. Honorable Chairperson, we call upon the DECO to continue to support the removal of the economic embargo against Cuba. South Africa must continue to pledge solidarity with Cuba and campaign tirelessly for the release of the Cuban Five. The Cuban people and their government contributed in no small measure and paid a heavy price to secure the freedom, democracy, and the human rights that we now enjoy in South Africa. Our parliament should garner the the support for Cuba through its membership in inter-parliamentary bodies such as the Pan-African Parliament, the SADC Parliamentary Forum, the UN, and the Non-Aligned Movement. I would like to recall the words of President Zuma when he reminded us, I quote, that democratic South Africa's foreign policy was shaped by many decades of ago during the fierce international campaign to isolate the Af apartheid state. ANC President Oliver Tambo played a key role in that regard assisted by, amongst others, the late Johnny Makatini, former head of international affairs, unquote. This history, this is history we must not forget, but most importantly, we must ensure that this history and the key tenets of our foreign policy as it stands today are known to the people of South Africa. To this end, Minister, public diplomacy must be strengthened to ensure that we are able to mobilize the support of the people and this can only be achieved if our people have a clear understanding of our strategic decisions. Honorable Chairperson, I would like to advise that the department pay due and particular attention to the following areas. Introducing a deliberate policy requirement that all officials at their co-head office and missions abroad undergo economic diplomacy 
training and reorientation program. This would ensure that economic diplomacy forms the basis for aligning foreign policy to domestic priorities. Secondly, that the headquarters of the Pan-African Pen Parliament be expeditiously constructed, working with the Department of Public Works. The department finalized its asset register of its, of its mobile and fixed property in all its missions. That the ICT infrastructure in all the missions be upgraded to suit the modern practices. As I conclude, I therefore beseech this August gathering to vote in favor of the budget of the Department of International Relations and Cooperation. Honorable Masango, Gwan Jesse is Zogbiza Ilunga Elfun Pegilego, U Honorable Mohalapa. Thank you, Chairperson, Minister, Deputy Ministers, Diplomatic Corps, and esteemed guests. Honorable members, let me also take this opportunity to send our deepest condolences to the people of Malaysia on the tragic of the MH7 and all other countries involved. Honorable members, 20 years ago, the founding father of our democratic state, Nelson Mandela, declared that human rights will be the light that guides our foreign policy moving forward. South Africa was seen as the beacon of hope and a shining example for the world. We had global respect. Human rights-based foreign policy is what made us one of the esteemed global citizens and claim our pole position in international relations among the global players. However, over the past 15 years, South Africa has dropped the ball in our global moral standing. Our foreign policy has lost direction. The government has taken very dubious stances in multilateral fora. South Africa needs to reclaim itself and take its place as a leading moral compass. We do understand the need to balance our economic interests and domestic needs against human rights. This is not an easy task at all, and we agree. Honorable Chairperson, the DA stands with the rest of the world in mourning the tragic loss of life in the current conflict in Gaza. The DA condemns the continuing escalation of this conflict by both sides. We condemn strategies employed by both Israel and Hamas that have resulted in the death or that continue to threaten the lives of civilians, specifically of women, children, and the elderly. Violence will only yield more violence and make the conflict even more intractable. Israel and Palestinian leaders must return to the negotiations. All hostilities must be brought to an end, and all strategies employed that result in the death of civilians must cease immediately. The DA strongly reiterates the call made by both the United Nations and the Department of International Relations and Cooperation for an immediate ceasefire. We, in particular, would like to reiterate the position of DECO, and I quote, South Africa therefore strongly urges both Israel and Hamas to work towards a ceasefire agreement which will be the basis for the resumption of the negotiations towards a permanent resolution to the conflict, a two-state solution of a viable Palestine existing side by side and in peace with Israel. This too remain the DA's position. The NDP states that South Africa's foreign policy should be driven by a clear and critical understanding of our national, regional, and continental imperatives. It is for this reason that we are calling for a clear definition of our national interest. Our foreign policy should be driven by a clear desire to ensure that our national interests are pursued to respond to our pressing domestic imperatives. A clear alignment of our domestic imperatives with our foreign policy output is important. The absence of a clear outline of our national interest will result in our foreign policy being labeled as eclectic as observed by Dr. Zondi from the Institute for Global Dialogue. Minister, our foreign policy and our global footprint should reflect and respond to who we are as South Africans. Whenever we decide to have relations, we need to ask one question. What is our domestic strategic need we would like to achieve in particular relations? If we fail to do that, we are in a danger of being inconsistent and overcome by the murky world of diplomacy. 
Chairperson, it is not enough to only respond to political and alliance needs, loyalty and past relations. There is a famous saying in the world of diplomacy that goes, there are no permanent friends in foreign policy, only permanent interest. Allow me to highlight some of the concerns in the department's annual performance plan. Program two, the international relations with a budget of 2.8 billion is the largest consumer of the department's annual budget. 48% of the department's budget is spent here. The NDP diagnostic overview highlighted the fact that South Africa is stretching, overstretching itself in terms of its global footprint. That means that we, the department is punching above its weight. There are 125 missions abroad in over 160 countries. This is unsustainable considering the current international political climate and financial meltdown amid our sluggish economic growth. It is not time, or is it not time, that we review our missions and see if we have value for money. We need to evaluate if the means justify the ends. Chairperson, as to date, our trade relations in our missions are skewed and not adequately responding to our domestic imperatives. For example, in Africa, there are 47 missions and only three bilateral engagement and four trade seminars. While our foreign policy is focused on the African agenda, there is so little intra-Africa trade. While in Europe, the situation is different. Out of 28 missions, we have six bilateral and 38 trade seminars. This minister clearly gives an indication of where there is value for money. This calls for the department to take a step back and review our foreign missions in this tight burdening environment. It is important that we conduct due diligence and ensure our foreign missions add value and address our needs. Currently, it is not the case. Chairperson, this brings me to another point, which is oversight and accountability. There is a significant oversight deficit in our foreign missions which needs to be addressed. We only hear through the grapevine what is happening in our foreign missions, and we as a committee cannot conduct proper oversight. How do we follow the money? How do we track the 2.8 billion that we appropriate without ensuring that the money is well spent? There have been reports of fraud and corruption in our foreign missions, for example, the mission in Ghana, we would like to know the status of the investigations and any consequences thereof. This gives the wrong impression about South Africa and needs to be addressed properly. The department cannot properly account for the assets in foreign missions. The long-standing debate about leasing or buying of property must be clarified and addressed. We are conscious of the fact that there are foreign currency fluctuations which affect our spending. However, with proper planning, we can address the issue of overspending and unforeseen circumstances. Our foreign missions are our eyes and ears to the world and should be treated with caution. Chairperson, allow me to further address you on the next issue, which is Program 3, the International Cooperation. South Africa needs to engage in candidacy diplomacy to influence the multilateral programs that we participate in by ensuring that South Africans fill up the positions in these institutions. It is not useful to always pay our membership fees without any influence in these institutions. Hence, we urge the minister to prioritize this. We acknowledge and endorse the appointment of Dr. Nkosasana Dlamini Zuma as the AU Commission Chairperson and Pumzile Mulambonguga as the UN Executive Director of Women and Navi Pillay on the UNHCR. But this is not enough considering our membership and participation in these forums. SADC integration is moving slow and we need to move with speed to ensure that it is realized. We need to deal with barriers of integration and pertinent issues of infrastructure, good governance and democracy to ensure sustainable and prosperous integration. By now, we should have a free trade area in the SADC region. The deadline was March and we need to hear what the progress is, Minister. We need to ensure that the African Peer Review Mechanism and NEPAD are strengthened so that the AU can fulfill its mandate of ensuring development, democracy, and human rights and good governance on the African continent. We call upon the re-establishment of the SADC Tribunal to ensure justice in the region. Chief Justice Mukweng at an AU consultative workshop also called for this tribunal to be reinstated. Minister, we are concerned about the resolution taken by the AU heads of state in Equatorial Guinea that endorsed a resolution on the protocol on amendment to the protocol on the statutes of the African Court of Justice and Human Rights 
That will allow immunity for sitting heads of state and senior government officials not to be prosecuted for human rights abuses. It is against international law and Rome statutes of the ICC and a travesty to justice to the people of Africa. South Africa cannot be seen to be backtracking on its foreign policy mandate of human rights, international law, and justice. Chairperson, the other concern is the vote in the United Nations Human Rights Council, where South Africa voted against the LGBTI resolution of family language. This is a shift from a human rights-based foreign policy and against South Africa's constitutional obligation of the right to freedom of sexual orientation. How can we abandon our constitutional human rights? We need an explanation, Minister, of why we would do such a thing to appease our BRICS allies. When will the Minister host the regional summit of the LGBTI as promised? We commend our membership of ECOSOC and we believe it's a step in the right direction. Our growing role in BRICS is noteworthy and we await the BRICS Development Bank in Shanghai. We trust that our interest will be well protected with the African Regional Branch. Chairperson, Program 4 of Public Diplomacy is very important to communicate South Africa's role and position in international relations to both the local and international audience. We support the work of this program and we would like to see more funding and resources allocated here. We would also like to see this program being strengthened and capacitated to fully discharge its mandate. Public diplomacy should be able to reach every corner of South Africa and the world to explain our foreign policy decisions and objectives. We welcome the launch of Ubuntu Radio into DSTV, and however, we also caution that this radio platform should not be abused for propaganda, but to deliver our foreign policy message and to engage in diplomacy. We are concerned about the internal audit of report of the Africa Renaissance Fund. We would like to receive a full report on the ministerial investigation into ARF and would like to know what actions the minister will take to ensure that those found to have done wrong are dealt with. We are also equally concerned about the lack of oversight and accountability on the ARF Two project. Minutes. This is a three million rand program and we would like to see better oversight. We look forward to the establishment of SATBA to replace ARF and hope it will address the integrity of the ARF and be managed better. Chairperson Dr. Zondi of the Institute for Global Dialogue made one of the following observations. We need to make our foreign policy inclusive. We need to evaluate our binational commissions. We need to increase public engagements in foreign policy. That means engaging in more public diplomacy. We agree. And lastly and importantly, we need to define our national interest. We agree with these observations. Honorable Chairperson, the DA's foreign policy as an alternative call for a balance between human rights and economic interest. We believe that our national interest should be to grow the economy, to create jobs, and to ensure quality education, and to have global economic competitiveness. In conclusion, we need to align our foreign policy to our domestic policy and ensure that there is a clear definition of our national interest. We must do this while reclaiming our local and international lost moral compass. This can only be done by aligning our foreign policy back to human rights. Indeed, honorable members, we can still be the beacon of light and hope that we were in 20 years ago in recognition of the work done by our democratic founding father, Nelson Mandela. Let us hope this again becomes a reality. I thank you. Thank you, Honorable Mukhalaba, Honorable members of the public. We really do appreciate your presence here, but refrain from participating in the debate with the gestures and all. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> We now call upon Honorable Munsami. Honorable Chairperson, there are no international relations and corporations that can verify any value contributed to avoiding the current political, social, and economic state of the continent and the world. EFF is calling for a radical internationalist outlook that seeks to liberate the oppressed people of the world from the current global socio-political exploitative neoliberal global capitalist system. The EFF instructs that international relations is not about sending troops to fight illegal wars 
and deploy our soldiers to die. South Africa's so-called foreign policy based on economic diplomacy of state and personal business interest of the family of the president that have horrifically been exposed by South Africa's continued protection of business interest at the expense of taking a sound stance against atrocities being perpetuated by terrorist Israel against the people of Palestine. Israel attacks hospitals, killing the infirm. The position from South African government is a gutless one against Israel because in South Africa, hospitals are where people go to die. EFF is calling for an immediate expulsion of the Israeli ambassador and not leave for hours but recall without return. We demand the end of Israel's illegal occupation and further instruct South Africa to end all business with companies that continue to perpetuate terrorism in Palestine. The situation rings so of the plight of the people of Western Sahara, who remain without a state and at the murderous behest of Morocco. Our position on relations with oppressive regimes must end now. What international relations are we influencing when we remain a permanent powerless visitor in the United Nations Security Council? We will remain powerless for as long as this is a nation whose people do not own its land, and hence we do not even aspire sovereignty. South Africa's power is traded in the name of economic diplomacy because it chooses to export our natural resources as opposed to securing benefit to our people through rapid industrialization. South Africa is an international comedy, having failed to lead the African struggle on the continent and so consequently losing our mandate on the continent to Nigeria that is most populous in Africa, seething with terrorism, bleeding its competent and skilled citizen. South Africa, however, unleashes daily economic terrorism and genocide on its people. This we see through irredeemable levels of poverty, inequality, crime, and labor controversies, mass murder massacres, and the catastrophe of lack of political leadership. It is quite clear that South Africa should at no point engage itself with any international matters if it is unable to resolve its domestic problems. The world and the continent acknowledges that South Africa has betrayed the African agenda and sees it as a sub-imperial power. EFF and the continent has lost trust and respect in South Africa's dizzy approach to international relations, as it should abide by EFF's cardinal pillar number six, which speaks to massive development of the African economy and advocate a move from reconciliation to justice on the entire continent. The silence on the establishment of the African Command Center by America in SADC is deafening. How will we respond if such act of terrorism happen here? Will we wait for weeks to pass before we blame ourselves and blame our people like President Zuma who blames Hamas even when lives are lost in Gaza? EFF calls for the immediate disbandment of the imperialist military base in Botswana and the surrender of imperialist forces to people-driven reform and encourage prosperity for all of Swaziland and not just the family of the dictatorial monarch and continued undemocratic system and practices because the ANC refuses to act on its so-called special resolutions. As we continue to mourn the premature passing of our beloved brother and revolutionary leader, Mohammed Abu Minyar al-Gaddafi, we will never forget that the President of South Africa opted to undermine the collective wisdom of the African Union and seek the permission of the European Union regarding Tripoli. This is why the African agenda has failed in his hands. How have we accounted for hundreds of millions of rands spent on the establishment of the African Renaissance Fund through the Act of Parliament in 2000, whose mandate is to enhance good governance and socio-economic development and integration, to name but two, when government has done everything but that which it has been allocated for? Adding to the mayhem is the approval of the uh, South African Development Partnership Agency by Cabinet in 2009, whilst a new bill will be tabled for the repeal of the ARF and the establishment of a new fund. This is the extent to which this budget has reduced the African agenda to pure mockery and disregard. We vote no. Honorable member, thank you. Thank you, Honorable Monsami. Siobiza Manje. Ilunga Elson Pegile, Lalenju, Honorable Mwango. Thank you, uh, Honorable uh, Madam Chairperson. Uh, from the very onset, the IFP uh, 
supports the budget. But in doing so, the IFP would firstly uh, like to extend its condolences to the people of both Palestine and Israel who have lost their loved ones in this current conflict. As the IFP, we condemn in the strongest possible terms any form of violence used as a means to resolve conflict. For that reason, we ask that both parties lay down their arms and observe a cessation of hostilities. They should continue to give negotiations and diplomacy a chance, as it is only through those means that the senseless loss of life can be halted. The IFP has always supported a two-state solution to this vexing conflict. It can only be through this that conflict can cease and lasting peace and coexistence achieved. It is also critically important that South Africa not only be seen to be pragmatic and neutral in its approach to this situation, but must also take active steps to promote peace. Our government's current approach through the ANC's um, political antics lends itself to be perceived to be taking sides in this conflict. If that is the case, Madam uh, Chairperson, it could compromise its international standing, which was fostered by the former President Nelson Mandela, that South Africa is an honest uh, peace broker. By supporting one side one and vilifying, and vilifying the other, the South African government runs the risk of damaging its standing and compromised its position on issues relating to this conflict. Both parties in this conflict have national aspirations that need to be acknowledged and supported. Israel has a duty to protect its citizens, as no state should allow its citizens to live in fear of another state that keeps firing a relentless barrage of missiles at it. This is understandable. But what is equally wrong is Israel's adoption of, of collective punishment of Palestinian people for the wrongs that Hamas has done. The Palestinian people cannot be indiscriminately described as supporters of Hamas, and so by default as the enemy. Many lives have been lost because of such classifications. We appeal to the international community to assist both parties to find peaceful solutions to the crisis that they are in now. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Honorable Mwango, we now call on the Honorable, the Deputy Minister of International Relations and Cooperation, Honorable Mfeketo. Thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson. Honorable members, Your Excellency, Ambassadors, High Commissioners, and representatives of international organizations, distinguished guests, I'm honored to address this House on this very important occasion of our budget vote of the Department of International Relations and Cooperation. As we celebrate 20 years of freedom and democracy in our country, it's important to always remember that this is a result of a negotiated set solution taken through the collective wisdom of the visionary leadership of the time. There were other options that could have been pursued if we were driven by short-sighted, vengeful ambitions of settling scores with perpetrators of injustices. The celebration of 20 years of democracy is a reaffirmation of the correct decisions taken then by the wisdom of the collective leadership with a long gaze into the future for later generations to continue building on a firm foundation for non-racial 
non-sexist, democratic, and prosperous South Africa. With this as the spine of our freedom, we stand upright with reassurance to build upon our work with great zest in the next five years for the execution of solid plans which in turn contribute to the long-term goals of our National Development Plan. During the release of the 20-year review of South Africa, President Jacob Zuma praised the nation as follows, I quote, this is an occasion to reflect on what has been achieved in our country over the past 20 years by South Africans working together. The 20-year review is packed with facts and figures to support its analysis, and it is honest and frank in its approach, where the facts indicate that we have made progress, we say so, and where the facts indicate that we have challenges and have made mistakes, we also say so, close quote. We also move forward into the future with great optimism to realize a prosperous Africa, which is at peace with itself, as well as a better world. As the great Madiba once envisioned, with a reminder of his first birthday without him last week, we continue to treasure his memory and the 67 minutes of service marks the, intervention, the invention of a new tradition in the history of our country. We salute this great son of Africa, as well as all departed leaders and dedicated cadres that served and sacrificed their lives for this great nation. Honorable Chairperson, honorable members, as we celebrate in 20 years of freedom and democracy, a human tragedy is unfolding in the Middle East. An injustice and gross loss of, life, of human life which cannot go unabated in Gaza and other regions of that sacred region of the world is continuing. This tragedy could also serve as a vindication of our collective wisdom in South Africa, as the same fate could just be on our shores had we gone the route of military combat. As we celebrate our freedom, let us remember that for other oppressed people in the world, this is but a distant dream, but we have much to share as we are. Last week, in the wake of Israel offensive into Palestine, we call in the ambassador of Israel to express our grave concern over the escalation of violence between Israel and Palestine, which has resulted into the loss of civilian life and the destruction of property. We called on both parties to immediately observe a ceasefire and for the state of Israel to allow safe and free passage of civilians and the operation of humanitarian organizations to alleviate the suffering. Furthermore, we called on both Israel and Palestine leaders to immediately resume negotiations leading to a two-state sol solution with economically viable Palestine state existing side by side in peace with Israel, with mu within mutually agreed and internationally recognized borders based on the 4th June 1976 lines. We demanded the immediate halt of, to the construction and expansion of settlements in the occupied Palestine by the Israel government, which not only violate international law, but also gravely undermine peace efforts and threaten the viability of the two-state solution. We here reiterate all the above positions and continue to oppose any threat of ground invasion and Two urge minutes. the state of Israel to refrain from making utterances to that. We object to any attempt to use the current situation to undermine the unity of Palestine. Uh, Chairperson, you say two minutes. 
Asia has emerged to change the face of international power dynamics and strong ties um, with South Africa. In the last decade, Asia has emerged to be South Africa's number one trading partner. And this is a good story to tell and a highlight of a success of our foreign policies to create jobs. Um, let, let me skip. Honorable member, China remains our good friends and therefore critical not only to our own development, but also that of the African continent as a whole. Um, given the nature of our trade relations currently dominated, uh, Chairperson, you disorganize me. <laughs> Order, honorable members. Uh, in my two minutes. Okay. Uh, Honorable Chairperson, we are of the firm view that the tangible benefit of our relation with countries uh, in Middle East must be felt by ordinary masses of our people. If we can be able to achieve this milestone, we will have set our relationship with the region in the right path. It is imperative that a good story of our international relations be told. This should include reference to our success and challenges. Honorable Deputy Minister. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Your time has expired. <laughs> Thank you, Honorable Deputy Minister. We now call on the Honorable Kenya. Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Ministers and Deputy Ministers, members of Diplomatic Corps, Honorable Members of this House and guests, ANC supports the budget vote for the Department of International Relations and Cooperation. <laughs> it is true our, that our democracy was born out of a fierce struggle by the majority of South Africans, whose only sin was to be black. Our mothers, fathers, brothers and sisters were scattered all over the world in search of human dignity and solidarity to defeat the evil system of apartheid. Indeed, Honorable Chairperson, our own experience, as confirmed by the President in his State of the Nation address, shaped our foreign policy. It has been central in our policy as the ruling party that the African dignity and self-worth must be restored for Africa to take its place in the world of international politics. For Africa to command respect and authority globally, our approach has been that of ensuring peace, stability, and support of democratization of the continent. These lessons we learned from our own painful experiences of the past, which more often than not came dearly through loss of life and breakdown of families. The continent is still afflicted by pockets of conflicts in some countries such as Mali, DRC, Guinea-Bissau, Somalia, and so on. And the ANC is steadfast in supporting these countries through various political platforms. The president was among the leaders of that struggle and played a key role in campaigning against and fighting the evil system. Through to the spirit of brotherhood of men of, and Ubuntu, our leaders and comrades were accommodated in the different African countries as well as around the world. This experience shaped our foreign policy and ensured it is centered on Africa, its development and security. This administration will continue to support the development and economic integration of the continent to the structures of SADC and NEPAD. As the Minister of Internal Relations and Cooperation, Honorable Mwane Mashapane, recently pointed out, I quote, a key component of South Africa's foreign policy for Africa is support for the establishment of peace and political stability in order to create the foundations for democracy as a necessary prerequisite for sustainable social and economic development. Chairperson, the ANC supports the various efforts to stabilize these countries, such as the efforts of the African Union and the United Nations to bring a lasting solution to the DRC. The efforts of Economic Community of Western African States 
African Union and UN to resolve the conflict in Mali and similarly in Guinea-Bissau. As the ANC, we will never forget the support of PAIGC and other liberation movements and current governments that gave us in our struggle, and we therefore commit ourselves to work with other liberation movements and governments on the continent to assist our brothers to attain a lasting peace. As the ANC, we continue to work in the continent and the world through party-to-party -party relations, conflict resolutions in the continent, championing the global governance transformation issues, engaging in various campaigns and all these to make sure that we uplift our continent and create a better continent and a better world. Chairperson, given the wealth of mineral and natural resources in this continent, a peaceful African continent will lead to better economic opportunities for its inhabitants and therefore contribute significantly to a socio-economic development and a better life for all as championed by this centenary national liberation movement, that is the ANC. Chairperson, you must remember that at some point the ANC was viewed as a liberation movement for Southern Africa, so we have a responsibility to lead our brothers and sisters to the promised land of Chief Lutuli, Tata Tambo, Tata Sisulu, and Tata Mandela. <laughs> Chairperson, just to emphasize the importance of strengthening our relations with the continent, recently, the then Minister of Finance, Honorable Gordon, indicated that investment into Africa reached 36 billion rand a year in a range of industries, with South Africa being the second largest developing country investor on the continent, Siakuba. He further showed us that last year, our export to other African countries increased to 29%, with 12% of our dividends coming from the continent. This honorable chairperson is a clear indication that our foreign policy with reference to Africa is bearing fruit. This emphasizes the point that we must not relent, but multiply our efforts to create economical and political stability in the continent through the organs of SADC, thus taking the continent forward. Therefore, on economic growth, there is a collective determination to turn Africa into one of centers of rapid industrialization and social development. As the ANC and ANC-led government, we are committed to a just, humane, equitable, and free continent. Our foreign policy is anchored by the Freedom Charter, which states, I quote, there shall be peace and friendship. That is the last clause. We want to create a better Africa and therefore a better world. This is what drives us. ANC continues to seek a path of hope and human solidarity to pursue and to pursue effective dialogue and mutual friendship among peoples of the world, proceeding from the premise that all nations have shared responsibility to collectively improve the human condition. Honorable Chairperson, as the continent continues to strive to the best that it can be, South Africa will continue to lead the efforts of ensuring that the African agenda is never forgotten. South Africa will continue to champion the cause of economic and political stability to ensure a better life for all Africans. The hard work of the Department of International Relations and Cooperation is commendable with regards to their efforts to strengthen the support of Africa's multilateral structures, especially with reference to African Union and SADC. These structures are central in making sure that countries in the continent achieve peace and security. Honorable Chairperson, we support the President and the Executive through the Honorable Mr. Ngwane Mashabane in prioritizing the promotion of regional economic integration, infrastructure development, intra-African trade, and sustainable development in the continent. Our leaders have pedigree in peacemaking and conflict resolution in the continent. From President Zuma in his years as Deputy President of the country to former President Megi to our current Deputy President, Honorable Cyril Lamaposa. The department plays a key role in ensuring that these efforts come to bear fruit. Honorable members, it is my humble submission that we should all roll up our sleeves and support these noble initiatives to make our continent a better place. Thank you, Chairperson. Yeah, thank you very much, Honorable Member. May we now call upon our member, Hold on, Chairperson. Are you governable? Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Minister and Honorable Deputy Ministers, Honorable Members, the recent and rapid developments in the global political landscape demands of 
the South African Parliament an active and central role in the conduct of foreign policy. The mandate of the Parliamentary Portfolio Committee on International Relations and Cooperation should stretch beyond oversight on activities of the department to include assessment and evaluation of executive decisions and commitments made in the execution of our foreign policy and actions. Such an approach would allow us an opportunity to present a united front in conflicts such as in the Middle East. In this regard, a radical intervention from South Africa must seek to champion the implementation of the UN Security Council resolutions on the Middle East. South Africa should engage all other states who tend to undermine the multilateral decisions on this ongoing conflict. Chairperson, on the 9th of September 2013, I penned a letter to the President of the Republic, the then Minister of uh, Public Service and Administration, and carbon copied the then and current Minister of International Relations and Cooperation, in which I alerted the President to serious and disturbing information of looting of African Renaissance Fund. These concerns were also reported to the Minister of International Relations and Cooperation by the Audit, Audit Committee of the Department. The Audit Committee held an opinion. One minute. That, I quote, that the management report together with the audit report uh, are materially misleading, not through reflection of the state of affairs, and are not fair presentation of the financial position of the department. The amount uh, involved here exceeds half a billion. Uh, it is in the public interest that this matter be disposed as soon as possible. Until this has been addressed, the United Democratic Movement cannot support Budget Vote 5. Thank you. We now call upon Honorable Member Likota. I've got four minutes. I've been giving, I've been giving four. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, First of all, uh, we are indebted to the minister and others who have already expressed our condolences to those who lost their lives and so on. Chairperson, with regard to this budget, would like to concentrate our focus on this question of the new development bank. At the present time, the minister has informed us that we are all equal in the, in the fund. Now, from what I've seen in the papers, China will contribute 40 billion rand to the contingency reconstruction uh, fund, and we will contribute five. Now, by all calculations, we cannot be equal. The nations which participate with us have huge reserves uh, and we don't have, as, as a matter of fact, we are uh, more than a trillion rand in debt as a country. I've been wondering to myself, where are we going to get the, the 10 uh, billion uh, that we, dollars that we need to contribute? Because it, it does suggest to me we may have to go and borrow that money so that we put it in the fund so that we can borrow from that money. And I'm talking, uh, in this situation, in this situation, why don't we just borrow money and do our own reconstruction instead of trying to set up a bank when we don't have money with which to pay our own international debt? This situation is also put us in a very difficult position. The Bretton Woods institutions which have been lending money for the last 60 years since the end of the Second World War to various nations of the world, if they call their debt to those countries that owe them, what are we going to do? We ourselves 
are now in danger, our African agenda is in danger because many African countries, in fact all of them who have international debt, they are indebted to, to the Bretton Woods institutions. Now the question for me is, how are we going to ask them to vote with us when they know that they are going to be voting against people to whom they are heavily indebted? I think we must tell South Africans the truth that we do not have, we, we are taking on obligations which as things stand today, we do not have the capacity to carry. And South Africa has to be realistic about that. We have to be realistic because we will leave our children and grandchildren an inheritance of a huge unmanageable debt. The future doesn't look as bright as one, the beautiful speeches remaining, uh, that have been delivered here say. You know, it was, it was uh, the late Bob Kennedy who told the Stellenbosch students in 66 that there is always a wide and dra tragic gap between ideal and reality. Let's not repeat the mistakes of the old order who taught their people that there's a difference between black and white human beings. When that was not true, history has since disproved it. We can't say we are equal to country, with countries that, whose growth rate is seven, eight, nine percent when ours is going down all the time. Honestly, South Africans, let's look at our hard realities and take decisions that help to change our situation for the better. I thank you. Honorable Member Dudley. I know. Good. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Chair. South Africa's engagement with the world has been increasing since 1994. We host the second largest number of foreign representation in the world with 125 missions covering 180 countries. And the minimal budget the department operates on year after year is even more stretched by unpredictable and often unstable circumstances externally. The ACDP applauds the department's efforts but has called for an audit on missions and an assessment of whether all missions are essential to the broader goals and objectives. Having once again interrogated the budget alongside colleagues on the committee, the ACDP will be supporting this budget with all its constraints and challenges. There are so many issues the ACDP would like to speak to today, many of which the minister and others have touched on, like the young woman from Nigeria whose whereabouts are still not known, and the DA's shameful opposition to promoting and protecting family, making the issue something that it's not. I will use my short few minutes, however, to express appreciation for the discipline shown by our president, the minister and her department, and the portfolio committee in resisting the temptation to add to the one-sided condemnation of Israel at this time. Without a doubt, government will be between a rock and a hard place right now, because no matter how personal this is, they cannot unknow what they know about both sides. Being pro-Palestine and pro-Palestinian people has got to be more than condoning religious fanaticism and the form of Islamic extremism and covering for those who so ruthlessly use and abuse their own. This, shame, this same Islamic extremism is destabilizing Africa and is a huge threat globally. Yes, let's fight for the rights and freedoms of Palestinian people and for the rights of those in Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Egypt and Iraq, but let's fight for life and not death and let's be sure who the oppressors actually are. The ANC has expressed themselves on the issue through their national executive and their parliamentary caucus and in time the parliamentary committee is likely to want to express itself as well. War is a terrible thing and the ACDP is grieved by the loss of life, the terrible anguish families on both sides of this tragedy are facing at this time. The ACDP notes the German Chancellor Angela Merkel on Friday at a news conference in Berlin said both sides must accept painful compromises, but we stand by the side of Israel when it comes to self-defense. Merkel said that there was a new quality to weapons used by the Palestinian territories Hamas group against Israel and added that countries under attack must be allowed to defend themselves. For Israel and the world, 
The most dangerous weapon in Gaza is not the M302 rockets that have put millions of Israelis under direct threat to terror. It is the ideology of Hamas, ideology that is focused on destruction, Israel's destruction, and then who next? We note Hamas leader Khalid Mishal's uh, statement that before Israel dies, remember. it must be humiliated and degraded. Something the media and the anti-Israel chorus don't mention is that the Qasem rockets actually rained down on Israel for more than a week before the Israeli military finally responded. Every innocent civilian killed, regardless of which side, is tragic. All the more tragic, though, when it is a goal knowingly pursued by Hamas to protect its weapons and to gain international legitimacy as victims. Regardless of my opinion and your opinion, or the opinion of the ACDP, or that of the ANC. South Africa's foreign policy in this regard must protect life, promote peace, and support development. Palestinian people and Israeli people have no future unless it is a shared future, and the help South Africa must give is to help both peoples find a way to do this. Thank you. May we now call upon the Honorable Deputy Minister Landers. Honourable House Chairperson, Honourable Members, Honourable Minister, Your Excellencies, Ambassadors, High Commissioners and Representatives of International Organisations, Distinguished Guests, it is an honour and privilege to stand before this House to present my first budget vote speech as Deputy Minister of International Relations and Cooperation. <clears throat> Let me begin by paying tribute to my predecessors the former Deputy Ministers, the Honourable Ibrahim Ibrahim and the Honourable Marius Franzmann, for the formidable legacy that they have left behind. I am humbled to follow in their footsteps. Chairperson, our international relations continue to be guided by the same foundations that we laid 20 years ago. Led by the great son of Africa, Nelson Mandela, these are a firm commitment to a humane, just, democratic, free, and equitable world. We have played a leading role in championing human rights, pan-Africanism, equality, peace, reconciliation, and development, founding values that draw on the Freedom Charter and are deeply rooted in the long years of struggle for liberation. Our activism has been inspired by our experience of international solidarity, the ideals and principles for which so many of our heroes made the ultimate sacrifice, and the visionary leadership that emerged from South Africans, again led by Nelson Mandela, who were determined against all odds to build a nation that would be free from oppression, discrimination, inequality, and poverty. We remain determined to contribute to building a better world through the diplomacy of Ubuntu recognizing that in an interdependent and interconnected world, it is in our national interest to assist others to also have what we want for ourselves. In her eloquent speech today, the Honorable Minister noted that our foreign policy has a crucial role to play in the interventions required to realize the goals of our second transition. As much as our domestic policy priorities have always been a central objective of our foreign policy, over the next five years, the Department will dramatically intensify its efforts to create new opportunities to achieve the goals of the National Development Plan. In his State of the Nation address, the Honorable President Jacob Zuma made it clear that the economy takes center stage in a radical program to move South Africa forward to prosperity and success because the creation of decent work is the most effective weapon in the campaign against poverty. Economic diplomacy concentrating on export and tourism promotion, skills development and attracting foreign direct investment to priority sectors of our economy to create sustainable jobs and place the country on a more competitive global path is now the main focus of all our bilateral missions. During the coming year, we plan to aggressively expand our economic activities, which will include more than tripling the number of trade and investment seminars and engagements with chambers of commerce and high-level investors 
that we hold abroad. Chairperson, economic diplomacy lies at the heart of what we do in Europe and the Americas, which remain our primary investment partners and the principal buyers of our value-added exports. During the next, this coming year, we will strengthen relations with Europe, include, including working towards restoring bilateral trade levels to the pre-economic crisis period. Although still facing challenges, Europe is showing clear signs of recovery. Amongst other things, we plan to hold 97 trade and investment seminars and 82 tourism events in 2014-15 to achieve this. Chairperson, we celebrate the economic partnership agreement, which was initialed last week, and look forward to much greater access to the European market at a practical level. We hope to finalize all other outstanding issues with the European Union. We also want to pursue and finalize a binding agreement with all EU members for a favorable visa-free regime for all our citizens to enable a balanced and free movement, a privilege that current, currently only favors EU citizens visiting, visiting South Africa. People-to-people -people contacts enhance and create long-standing impressions and relations. We will intensify our work around culture, tourism, and student, ex student exchanges so as to solidify the excellent relations that already exist. Tourist arrivals from Europe grew 7% to 1.49 million in 2013, and our target for the next five years is to expand this threefold. Britain, Russia, and France are three of the five permanent members of the UN Security Council who exert influence on how the United Nations and its agencies function and are reformed. We want to intensify our engagement with these countries in order to accelerate the reform of the Council, and in particular, it is unacceptable that we still have an undemocratic, unrepresentative body managing the affairs of the globe. Mr. Minister, you have two minutes. Especially in the area of peace and security. The situation in Gaza and the Ukraine, where innocent civilians have been massacred, massacred is indicative of this. Chairperson, I had the honor and privilege of attending the G77 summit in Bolivia in the recent past. One of the heads of state addressing this summit made the point that the UN Security Council is a council that promotes insecurity. Whatever your opinion about that particular view, you must agree that faced with the various crises in various parts of the world, will the council's handling of these crises taint the legitimacy and credibility of its resolutions and interventions. There is further potential for substantial growth in, growth in trade and investment with the Americas and the Caribbean. Our commercial diplomacy with this important region will be enforced, reinforced in the year ahead by high-level meetings with key strategic partners. The Americas, Chairperson, are showing increasing interest in Africa and are important partners for the realization of the AU's vision 2063. Latin America and Africa share similar developmental trajectories, providing economic and political opportunities to pursue complementarities within the context of South-South cooperation. Honorable members, as the Minister and Deputy Minister have outlined, we have managed to excel in delivering on our foreign policy imperatives, despite having very limited resources. Against the odds, we have succeeded to do more with less, but as I am sure you will appreciate, this approach remains unsustainable going forward, especially given the scale Why of the Department's Deputy foreign currency commitments and recent developments in the foreign exchange rate. I thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Minister. May we now call upon Honourable Member Mpumlwana. Thank you, Honourable Chair. Um, Honourable Minister, 
Honorable Deputy Ministers and Honorable Guests, first of all, let me congratulate the Honorable Minister and the Deputy Ministers for the good work that you're doing and having been uh, deployed again into this position. You deserve it. On behalf of the African National Congress, I submit that this budget stands to be supported by all honorable members in this house, including honorable members from the left. It is a budget that is intended to move South Africa forward and indeed to promote the interests of the country. After being an international pariah for decades due to its relentless persecution of the doctrine of separate development, South Africa has and was welcomed into the sisterhood of the nations as from 1994, and has been able to put behind its decisive past and is now a united in building a new non-racial, non-sexist, and prosperous society. ANC takes credit for this. Yes, it does. <clears throat> The ANC has, from its launch in 1912, been based on progressive internationalism. It has been its view that injustice and violation of human rights is a phenomenon of universal proportion and progressive international forces should unite to fight against such undesirables. It has mobilized the international community to isolate the apartheid government and was in the same vein persuasive to the United Nations to declare apartheid a crime against humanity. It boasts two of its former presidents, Honorable Chief Albert Lutuli, Honorable Dr. Nelson Holkata Mandela, being recognized for, being, for their peace-building conduct through the prestigious Nobel Peace Prize. And she has indeed liberated all the people of South Africa, even the former oppressors. And it continues through decro programs to open many doors for all South Africa. South Africa today is a better country in a better Africa and a better world, which contributes towards building a better and safer world for all who live in it. Through diplomacy, Ubuntu, who does not want to do business in Africa? the world fast growing economy today. <coughs> Farmers are all over, in Zambia, everywhere, you mentioned. Business people are almost everywhere. South Africa can do business anywhere in Africa in the world. I therefore call upon uh, even the members across the floor to thank the ANC for liberating them. South Africa con conducts a foreign policy that promotes international justice and equality, respect for human rights, respect for international law, democracy, peaceful coexistence among nations, regional integration, and African unity and progress. It is the ANC's view that there should always be equal treatment of equals, and that those who break international law should face the might of international law. We are aware that all countries and nations should experience equal treatment regardless of size of such countries. We believe that this equal treatment will be experienced if the United Security, if, if UN Security Council is reformed. The UN Security Council's composition and veto system benefit the interests of the permanent member states only. UNS Security Council has substantial power that it can use negatively if it is not democratically constituted. The reforms we envisage include the following. Expansion of the Council in order to ensure representation of all regions of the world, especially which predominates the agenda of the Council year in, year out. The expansion should encompass both veto-wielding permanent seats and non-permanent seats, and improved uh, working methods, including the promotion of transparency in the agenda setting, and strengthening 
working groups to ensure an efficient council. Who can oppose such a heavenly sponsored view? South Africa was successful. South Africa was successful spons uh, in successfully sponsored UN Security Council Resolution 2013 for strengthening cooperation between UN South uh, Security Council and AU in peacemaking, peacekeeping, and peacebuilding missions in Africa. We also pride ourselves for being equal that they God members in BRICS. The following words of His Excellency President Jacob Zuma to the Six BRICS Summit plenary session in Fortaleza, Brazil, are not worth it. The summit saw, and I quote, the summit saw for the first time since the post Brenton Wood institutions era, the creation of a new and unique financing initiative. The agreements that were signed today mark our strengthened bonds of cooperation in the financial and economic domains, which will produce tangible results and impact on the lives of our people as we continue to address the challenges of inequality, poverty, and unemployment. Among the four agreements signed today is the agreement establishing our bank, the new development bank. There is a contribution that the bank has given at the time initially. But let me go to, into that. Let me say we also are participating in many other uh, global institutions. This includes the non-aligned movement. NC also participated in the non-aligned movement long before 1994. In 1955, there was the first gathering of forces of the Global South, the Non-Allied Movements Conference in Badung, in which ANC participated in shaping what would be known as a World Progressive Movement committed to non-aligned in the Cold War, non-proliferation of nuclear arms, non-interference in domestic affairs of countries, a peaceful resolution of conflicts, and the right of all nations to determine their own path. And uh, today, South Africa is ripping the foot of being a member of that organization. South Africa is also a member of the G77, G20, and various other bodies. It influences these bodies for its benefits. As a governing party, the ANC has used progressive internationalism including commitment to multilateralism, peaceful resolution of conflict, human rights, social justice, and the reform of global political and economic order as a prism of its role in the international affairs. It has, from conference to conference, also been guided by the need to link national interests to the achievements of better Africa and a better world. This government of the ANC is successful in building strong Africa and in deepening its agenda as our foremost principle and continues to be the centerpiece of our foreign policy. Driven by our objective of transforming the African Union into an eff efficient and effective continent body, together with SADC, we have successfully lobbied for the historic election of Dr. Dlamini Zuma as the first female chair of the AU Commission. <laughs> Inspired by the ANC ideal of non-racism, non-sexist, democratic society at peace with itself. <laughs> this diplomacy of Ubuntu, non-racism, non-sexism, and democratic society has inspired nations of the world to know that all human persons are equal. We have also planted, transplanted this to various countries. In the US, every citizen now, today, can stand for office, regardless of color of his own. Even DA has got uh, 
some black faces around him. This budget will therefore promote the stated program of the department, which include international relations, international cooperation, public diplomacy and protocol services, international transfers, as well as administration of such programs. It is thus my submission that the amounts inserted in this budget are all justified and that this budget should be supported in the interest of South Africa. Honorable Minister and your team, please carry on with the good work. God bless South Africa. I thank you. We now call upon Honorable Member Kalyan. Chairperson, judging by this morning's report presented by the Minister, it is clear that the Ministry of International Relations is a key ministry in the security cluster. One could say that it is the public face of the country after the presidency. How is it then that according to the NDP, in the section on South Africa's status in the world, it says that South Africa has experienced a decline in power and influence in world affairs and has even lost some of its moral authority in Africa. While the department itself is highly skilled and capable, the minister herself seems to skirt around issues like a floating cloud, especially in respect of policy formulation and direction. It would appear that the minister is quite content to be South Africa's meter and greeter in chief and would rather let the presidency and Latuli House make and comment on our foreign policy. Case in point number one, troops were deployed to the to car by the presidency. The minister was unaware of this. Case in point two, Mali received non-military aid from the Minister of Defense. Our minister was unaware of this. Case in point three, a plane full of wedding guests landed at Waterkloof with permission from the ministry's chief protocol officer. The minister was unaware of this. Mr. Kolani apparently had instructions from number one to okay the use of a national key point by his friends. You would think that he would tell his boss about it. All that the minister said is that she would talk to the Indian government about the behavior of the Indian Consul General, Mr. Virendra Gupta. And then what? We have heard in this debate of a quote by the, by the late Nelson Mandela that human rights will be the light that guides our foreign policy. Yet, I read it. That's who told me, I read. Yet it seems that we have abandoned the human rights pillar which underpins our constitution. South Africa holds a much coveted non-permanent seat on the UN Security Council, yet, Instead of flying the flag of human rights high, South Africa's voting record during the last two terms has been widely decried as we seem to seek misguided favor with rogue regimes. Case in point one, we voted against the human rights violations in Burma and Tibet. Case in point two, we are silent on the anti-gay legislation passed by the Ugandan government. Case in point three, we voted in favor of a resolution in the human rights, uh, UN Human Rights Council on the definition of a family which discriminates against same-sex couples. On that point, I'd like to tell the ACDP 
The DA is not ashamed to declare that we support equal rights for same-sex couples and will defend discrimination on the grounds of sexual orientation. Minister, there is an opportunity to redeem ourselves in the eyes of the world on this issue, and I hope you will do the right thing when there are further deliberations Jefferson. on this resolution, the resolution on the uh, 27th section. Just hold session. it. Chairperson, yes. is the member ready to take a question? Not at this stage. Thank you for asking, though. South Africa is host to the Pan African Parliament. Regrettably, Dirk I recognize the member. Okay, just hold on. Thank I you. recognize him. Would the member like to take a question? Not at this point. Thank you uh, for just asking. Just a minute, members. The member has already indicated she would like to finish her speech. Please. Continue, ma'am. South Africa is host to the Pan African Parliament. Regrettably, Durko seems to have abandoned its commitments in respect of housing PAP in more suitable premises. Having been an MP there since 2009, I can tell you from personal experience that we are literally squatting in the temporary quarters. While the debating chamber itself is fairly okay, we do not have suitable offices telephones, no access to IT facilities. The revised protocol of, PAN, of PAP transforming it from an advisory and consultative body to remember. that we have got two minutes. of a legislative body was approved at the 23rd AU summit. In your budget speech of 2008, Minister, you assured the august house that the new seat of PAP would be ready by 2010. Now your department says maybe 2016. Madam, I hope that you will step up to the plate and fast track the process, thereby honoring the host agreement. Madam, it's also the time has come for you to dispel the perception that you are the head of South Africa's reception committee and assert your role and influence over the formation and implementive implementation of effective foreign policy, as you did so admirably with COP17. The following matters need decisive action with speed from you. Update the IC pol ICT policy and infrastructure as a matter of urgency. It is outdated and quite unbelievable that in this day and age, it has not yet been done. Launch the SACIR without delay. It is a much needed institute to provide, analyze, and advise on foreign policy. The argument offered by your department that there are delays in finalizing the panel is weak. This idea was mooted in 2012. There are many skilled persons who could do the job, so get on with it. Enough of the feet dragging. Table the Foreign Services Bill without delay. And finally, implement the NDP's you, proposal you, of convening a high-level, high-impact team to investigate the South African foreign relations you, without further ado. I thank you. Members, before I call the next speaker, we, we have no problem, as it is your right to interject, but bearing in mind that this is an honorable house, our interjection should not have the result of drowning the speaker on the podium. Please. May we now call upon Honorable Member Khadeb. Honourable Chairperson, Honourable Ministers and Deputy Ministers, members of the Diplomatic Corps and the members of this August House, I want to state unequivocally that the ANC support Budget Vote 5. The, this Budget Vote is based on the National Development Plan. The National Development Plan Development plan came into existence because of the resolutions of the ANC in its 52nd watershed conference in Pulukwane. 
The ANC resolutions made a call for a creation of an institution which will make long-term planning for the state, that is the National Planning Commission. So it is very heartening and humbling indeed that the ANC really lives and leads. Because today, as we're speaking, the members on our left have wholeheartedly embraced the National Development Plan. Congratulations, African National Congress. You have done a good work. <laughs> what is also very important, what is very important here is that it is not only the parliament which is supporting the National Development Plan. The, the business sector, the civil society, and the labor movement, and the and the religious movements, they are all behind the region. So it shows that the work which was done by our forebearers, our Babul Tuli, our Bab Tambo, our Bab Mandela, has borne the fruits we are enjoying today. <laughs> the chapter seven of the NDP raises certain fundamental issues about the positioning of South Africa in the international arena. The first thing which it raises, it says that the the Department of International Relations, together with the government of the Republic, must really define the national interest. Apart from that, it also says that it must create adequate research capacity so that it can be able to respond to the issues as they arise every day and every night because the world is operating, is operational 24 hours a day. But what has happened here, Chair, is that with this budget vote we are having, we can look at program number one. That one deals with administration. It has been allocated 1.4 billion rand. In this allocation, one of the key things which are going to be served is to capacitate the department through human resource development. That is where we are going to have this research capacity which is going to be able to get us cutting edge recommendations as we are moving forward. But what is also important is that on the issue of the NT, on the chapter seven of the NTP, it raises an issue that the issues of trade must take center stage in the international relations arena. Because whatever you do, if at the end of the day it does not transform the ordinary lives of the people on the ground, that policy is not worth the paper it is written on. So this department, through its program number two, international relations, I'm going to expand a little bit around that. It has done a lot to address the very same issues of the National Development Plan. So when Honorable Mkhalapa said that we must implement, we are already implementing because this is our project. This is our pet project. You adopted it along the way. Tina, we know why, where we want to take it as we move towards the future. Chairperson, Ch Chairperson, one of the founding leaders of the OAU, Dr. Nkwame Krumah said in 1961, I quote, divided, we are weak, united, Africa could become one of the greatest forces for good in the world, close quote. As we participate in this budget vote debate on the Department of International Relations and Corporations for 2014-15, those wise ways of Dr. Nkwame Krumah are as relevant today as they were 53 years ago. This greatest force Africa could become could be obtained from the vast mineral and natural resources the, the African continent has. President Kuruma was one of the pioneers of the rapid industrial development, propagating that resource of Africa, resources of Africa must be beneficiated before they were sold into the markets. Here in this debate, we heard Honorable Munsami that we don't benefit, benefit goods as we export. I know that she only came to parliament this year. She's got a lot of cash up to do. This parliament, this parliament. Order, Chair. <coughs> What's your point of order? Um, I'm just uh, requesting that uh, the what honorable point of order. Withdraw point of order. His uh, statement regarding only coming here and what would No, 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 what is the point of order? Yes, it's an order on the statement that has been made by honorable. But what is the point of order? Order on his approach, Chair. No, no, no. Hon Honourable Member, sit down, because when you stand up, maybe let, let, let's, can, can, no, no, don't worry, your, your minutes are being taken care of. When you rise members for a point of order, say the point of order as you rise, so that we don't have to ask you what is the point of order. So, 
by saying you are here for, you came this year, and you want to raise a point of order on that, unless you are saying it is not factually correct. Is that so? <laughs> Let's leave it. Sure. Let's leave it at that. It is the assumption that a year would in, in, that a year would mean that there is a lack of experience or knowledge on an issue. Uh, can, can, can we can, s s sit down, member? There is nothing out of order in relation to what he has said. You can continue, honourable member. Honourable chairperson, <coughs> this government of the ANC has got uh, policies which are anchored in transforming the economy of the country. The first policy I want to refer the member to, to is the Industrial Policy Action Plan, which was also adopted by the Parliament of the Republic, which is also guiding our trade policy as the country. Remember that before 1994, the trade policy dictated the, 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 the domestic policy. Now, with that, with that policy, we have changed it around. We said that the national interest come first. That's why the trade policy now is informed by our own domestic policies. What are our domestic policies? Our domestic policies, one, industrial policy action plan. Number two, the new growth path. Whatever we're going to do, we're going to ensure that as we engage with the stakeholder, holders outside the world, we must ensure that those policies are, are adhered to so that at the end of the day, the jobs are created for the South African citizens. It was done in 19, 2012. That policy was adopted. So these policies didn't only fly from the sky. These policies fro came from the resolutions of the African National Congress. That's why in its 53rd com National Conference in Mangawu, the ANC made the Jaron call for the radical social economic transformation. This call entailed the radical shift of of way of managing the economy so that the economy can address the challenges of poverty, unemployment, and equality. These contradictions, which are there in the economy, are being addressed by the creation of the National Democratic Society. The National Democratic Society being a society which is going to be created as we enter the second phase of our transition from the apartheid past and colonial past to a national democratic society. What does that mean? This radical call of the NCB is that we should promote regional and continental integration so that we can promote intra-Africa trade. Chairperson, the important program of regional in integration has received a priority from this ANC-led government. That is why President Zuma has hosted the summit for the launch of the tripartite free trade area. This free trade, er this free trade area agreement will cover 26 countries with a total population of 600 million people and a combined GDP of 1 trillion US dollars. This, this big market will be strengthened by the free flow of goods and businesses in infrastructure de development. The example of that infrastructure is the North-South Rail Corridor championed by Presses Duma and the harmonization of the industrial development across the region. So this achievement, which has been made by President Zuma, that's what was not achieved by Cecil John Rhodes. One time Cecil John Rhodes dreamt of connecting Cape Town to Cairo. Je President Jacob Zuma has done that. He started from Cairo to Cape Town. Good report. Those things which have been elusive for many years, the ANC has been able to achieve that. That's why all of us should support this budget vote. Chairperson, Chairperson, the success of the tripartite agreement will depend upon the harmonization of regulations between the individual countries, e.g. customs, standards of products sold between the countries, lowering or elimination of tariffs, and the alignment of the IT systems in our border gates. Chairperson, the program two of the department, which is the international relations, has received the largest chunk of the budget, which is 2.8 billion which is 1.5% more than the previous allocation. This allocation is expected to improve economic diplomacy in the mission so that the country can increase value-added exports. So, Honorable Munsami, in this very budget, which you went through, it addresses really the issues which you raised. That's what we want to do. We are going to increase the value-added exports as, as we're moving forward. But what is also critical 
is that you have to attract the foreign direct investment to priority sectors as identified in the new growth path and industrial policy action plan. This will be done through hosting or participating in trade seminars and tourism promotions. This allocation will also promote engagement with chambers of commerce, high level of investors, and relevant ministries locally and internationally. One member said we have dropped the ball when coming to the international relations, international relations policy, which is wrong. That's why we speak now, as we speak now, 20 years down the line, the democracy lane, South Africa remains the highest benefactor of the foreign direct investment in Africa. It is second to none. Why is it like that? It is because of the progressive policies which it has instituted. It is because of the progressive policies which it has instituted. That's why it is not only the ANC. I heard Comrade Mpumluana saying that ANC must take credit for that. I say, Comrade, the Research Institute, like Ernest and Young in 2013, they, those are the people who confirmed that the, a, the ANC-led government in South Africa is receiving the highest foreign direct investment in the whole of Africa. Because of the integration program we are having within SADC and the tripartite free trade, ag uh, 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 free trade area, what has happened? This foreign direct investment has also dispersed to other countries within Africa. Let's make an example. The Grand Inga Dam. Hydroelectric Lento, Lento, Lento power, power station in the DRC. That project, which came into being because this NC led government brought stability in the DRC, has benefited more than 80 billion US dollars through the investment from the World Bank, from the European, European Bank, from the African Bank. Which ball did we drop? Because our Growth is not only for us because we come from children of we are children of Mandela. Ubuntu is that I am what I am because of what you are. So I cannot be successful when my neighbor is down, down, is down on the ground. That's why this issue of stabilizing the whole of Africa is the priority because at the end of the day, everyone is going to benefit. The weather port. <laughs> Out of that project of the Grand Inga Dam, the Inga 3 is going to export about 4.3. 4,300 megawatts of energy towards South Africa. Oh, what a benefit, what a good investment out of that. That's our foreign policy. Are we still comrade Honorable Munsam? Did we drop the ball? I don't think so. I don't think so. Let's go. Chairperson, South Africa advocates a development integration program. In, that aims to combine market integration for more open trade supported by infrastructure and economic diversification and regional industry. The region needs to upgrade and diversify its pro production structures to take advantage of the more open regional market. Chairperson, led by this very department, in 2012, this parliament ratified, no, not 2012, last year, it ratified the SADC trade protocol, which has led to 90% of intra-South African trade, SADC trade to be duty free. Did we lose the ball? The answer is no, we didn't, we are still advancing. And then what is very important out of that, South Africa has agreed to pursue further work to consolidate the free trade era by ensuring that all members meet their commitment in ensuring that this protocol works. But what is very critical out of that, on work on industrial development in SADC, it is underpinned by the adoption of industrial development framework focused on developing regional value chains in agro-processing, pharmaceuticals, mineral beneficiation. This is an exact answer why, what the NDP raised. What is the national interest? Our national interest is to ensure that the economy of South Africa and Africa is thriving. True, as I said, that the NGP plus the, I, the, the, the Industrial Policy Action Plan is exactly doing that. But what is very important out of this, Chair, is that uh, Dr. Nkwame Krumah, I like this man. He was very good. He was an idol by excellence. He once said in, 19, in the OAU summit of, of the OAU, he said, by far the greatest wrong the departing colonists inflicted on us we should continue to inflict ourselves in our present state of disunity was to leave us divided economically into economically unviable states which bear no possibility of 
real development, unquote. So the work which is done by this department through the creation of the tripartite free trade area plus the integration of SADC actually is realizing what Dr. Nkume could not do in his own lifetime. But as a prophet, he said, when he assumed presidency in, in Ghana, he once said that the liberation of the African continent is coming from the north, but the economic liberation will come from the south. Why did he say that? He said that because he knew that in the south, there was this organization, which is known as the African National Congress. And I say, wherever you are, Dr. Nkwame Nkrumah, the ANC has achieved your dream. Yes, yes. So, because we are in the budget vote debate here, we cannot allow certain things to be said and allow to go unchallenged. One of the issues which was raised by Honorable Kota on the issue of the creation of the National Development Bank, Comrade Kota is making us to shiver that we are going to disturb the West. But what I want to say is that we, in the African National Congress, we are the descendants of Mshweshwe. We are descendants of Shaga. We are descendants of Mahatma Gandhi. We are descendants of Dr. Nika. We are not afraid. So what we'll do is that we have never feared to take the struggle by the scruff of his neck. So this issue of multilateral organization, we are going to challenge them. This is one way of challenging that hegemony of those Britain. Honorable member, two minutes left. So what is also very important, Chairperson, is what was raised by Honorable Kalyan when he said that in the United Nations, the, the East government supported rock states. Do you know who's the worst rock state now? Let's go to Libya and see who's, what's happening there. Let's go to Iraq and see what is happening there. Why is the problem of Palestine and Israel being perpetuated? Who's actually sponsoring that? But it has never, on a single day, raised a word against that rock state. They have never raised a word against that rock state. So it cannot, they cannot come and lecture us how we deal with this thing. But what is critical here, Chair, is that we, being the children of Mandela, Honorable Mukhalapa, we said that loyalties of the past must be damned. Mandela, it was not his philosophy. Mandela said in Washington, I quote him direct, the morality of the South African people demands that we do not abandon our friends in their hour of need, unquote. So it means that once you have a friend, you don't teach them. You have to support them. That's, the, that's Mandela. So don't embrace Mandela only on one-sided, one dimension of him. Embrace him as a whole. Honorable Chairperson, the African National Congress supports this budget vote. Th thank you very much, uh, Honorable Member Khatib. I see we have got many shared leaders. <laughs> now we, we will call upon the Minister to respond to the debate. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson. It's always such a pleasure and an honor to sit among South Africans as I don't, if I'm not at what I do, my day job, to propagate the good diplomacy of the Ubuntu with humility across the globe. Great honor. I am honored to be a diplomat in chief for this very, very noble country, and I do it with pride, Honorable Kalyan. Let me say to all honorable members, Tau Chathoka, Sevoka, Dishitwa, Kenari Ethocha. Translation will happen over lunch. <laughs> From what I listened to, what many of us were saying here is that we need to urgently bring the white paper on our foreign policy of diplomacy of Ubuntu <coughs> to Parliament so that we all embrace that which we must go all out and defend. I know of uh, 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 democracies in the world, Brazilians, Indians, Americans, you can change parties in, in, in government, but you can never touch their defense policy 
and their foreign policy. It's always a shame to listen to South Africans struggling to say something against themselves instead of celebrating our successes. When we started, we said, we are supposed to have been, still be a post-conflict country, but we are being called in to help from Colombia to Sri Lanka to I don't know where else in a period of less than 20 years. I don't know how we would be called, being called upon if indeed moral compass was somewhere else. What we are told is that we are on track. If you go to an international meeting and you keep quiet and don't say anything, they say, this meeting cannot end. South Africa has not spoken. Human rights, we are one of the few constitutions in the world where human rights is enshrined in the constitution. Not what others say. No. What we champion, we are also not afraid to call a spade a spade to our friends. But how we do it, we will not do it through megaphone diplomacy because we have never seen it succeeding. We have said we need a genuine resolution and a stop to the killings of innocent people, particularly Palestinians. They've been killed far too many. And that's why we will send, we'll be one of the few countries that can send an envoy to both Palestine and Israel. And I repeat, we will send a delegation led by our former minister, Pahad. Honest peace brokering, that's what we've been doing, and Honorable Lokota is very much aware of that. He did not start and end with Mandela. He was there in cabinet. He didn't say this, but I'm just reminding him. That from Mandela to Mbeki to Zuma, the last stop then was when Zuma was deputy president, our president now, in Burundi. He lands at the airport in Burundi, ordinary Burundi, cheer like there's no tomorrow because of the work he did in helping them broker peace in their country. Public diplomacy is a branch we had started and we are very proud of the work they do. But colleagues, we have a dire shortage of resources. Let me repeat to those who have just joined parliament that South Africa will continue to provide leadership with humility, with responsibility, and we have also now know that commanding respect is better than demanding respect, and that there's no leadership. There's no leadership through insults. What is economic diplomacy? Economic diplomacy is, before I sell my goods to Japan, who is our very good uh, friend, if I may give an example, amongst the other friends we have in Asia, the backyard, our own neighborhood, with a one billion population, the continent of Africa, where Africans have always been buying and selling from each other, walking across borders before Berlin came and borders were formed. It's what we should be talking about. So when we say, let's continue training our diplomats in economic diplomacy, let's tell them that they are African first and that it will make political, economic, market sense if they remember next door. We will continue to champion multilateralism because that's the way we will get to our full multi, our full objective of multipolarism. Honorable Mpumlana was already engaging Honorable Lokota as to the difference between new development bank and contingency reserves arrangements. Contingency reserve arrangements, it's as much as it's a groundbreaker, it is the bank. There are two, two separate uh, entities, Your Excellency. The bank is a bank and we are full shareholding because we are founder members of the bank. So it's not about Secondly, contingency reserves arrangement, it's a groundbreaker because it will not wait for a an economic fallout or financial fallout like it happened in Greece and Spain and other places where people who had had 
borrowing, or borrowing other developing countries through IMF and World Bank, woke up one morning, they need, need to be borrowing their own backyard, and they realize how difficult those conditionalities are. So it is about early warning system and cushioning before the trouble starts, and we are very proud of. But let me also make another taking here, that we will come back and run a workshop about the outcomes right. of the BRICS, so that we all know what we are talking about. Absolutely if nothing you can, can compare. Up, if you can sum up, Minister. Yes, I'm summing up. Britain whose institutions and their conditionalities were not good. And that's why they themselves had admitted that there was space for this bank. We will never keep the eye away from the ball. And we will never run diplomacy of Batubatare. We will continue championing the spirit of Madiba everywhere we go with humility. I take this opportunity to thank the Honorable Deputy Ministers past, present, DG, DDGs and the team, and all senior officials, and my children for the support I get all the time during the good and not so good times. But above all, to thank fellow African men and women, South Africans, for the support you give to this very, very noble task that you have given us. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister. May we also join you and join my colleague, the Chair of Committees, in thanking all those who graced this occasion. We would like to thank you, our diplomats. I see many of them here. Um, indeed, our guests, who in the main come from the diplomatic environment, and uh, of course, the media also want to thank you for gracing this occasion. But the big thank you goes to members of this parliament uh, who have made us proud by debating such an important matter. How do we fit in in the world environment in South Africa? We would like to thank you, all of you, very much. Members, as you will know, uh, you are reminded that the debate on the parliamentary budget vote will take place at 14 hours in the National Assembly Chamber. So that is our vote, all of us, including you, Minister. <laughs> uh, now that concludes this debate, and uh, the committee will now rise. And thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much.